So you are in for a real treat this evening. I am blessed to be able to welcome Ed Finn to the Virtual Futures stage. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I'm the director of Virtual Futures. And for those of you who are here for the first time, the Virtual Futures Conference occurred at the University of Warwick in the mid-90s. And to quote its co-founder, it arose at a tipping point in the technologization of first world cultures. Now, whilst it was most often portrayed as a techno-positivist festival of accelerationism towards a post-human future, the Glastonbury of cyberculture, as The Guardian Put it, its actual aim hidden behind the brush still, the silicon, the jargon, the designer drugs and charismatic profits was much more sober and much more urgent. What Virtual Futures did, or at least tried to do, was cast a critical eye over the phenomenal changes in how humans and non-humans engage in emerging scientific theory and technological development. This Salon series completes the conference's aim to bury the 20th century and begin work on the 21st. So, let's begin. Tonight, we're joined by Ed Finn. Ed is the founding director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at Arizona State University, where he's also assistant professor with joint appointment in the School of Arts, Media, and Engineering in the Department of English. His new book, What Algorithms Want, reveals the cultural importance of the algorithm in modern society. As more and more information is being allowed to flow through our machines, independent of human intent, technologists now assert that we are living in an algo world. Nowhere is this more clear than on the stock market, which is now entirely reliant on the algorithm. But increasingly, it's getting personal, with these web codes calculating what we might be interested in and manipulating what we see on Google, Facebook, and other social media. Ed's book shows us what happens when we relinquish our agency to machines by examining the development of intelligent assistants like Siri, the rise of algorithmic aesthetics at things like Netflix, and the revolutionary economics of things like Bitcoin. So to explore the magic and perhaps the danger of the algorithm, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Ed Finn to the Virtual Futures stage. All right, so Ed, you say that the algorithm has its root in mathematical logic, cybernetics, and magical thinking. The, the, the one that's kind of odd there is, is the idea of magical thinking. In what way is an algorithm like magic? So every time you turn to your smartphone or you type something into Google, you're engaging in a certain kind of wishful thinking because you're believing that this machine is going to give you an oracular answer. Now, there's a rational component to that. Siri and Google, these, these are systems that do know a lot about the world, but they have clear limits, and it's very easy for us to forget about those limits or ignore them. It's very easy for us to forget all of the things that Google doesn't know and uh, to follow your GPS so slavishly that you drive your car into a lake, for example. Things like this happen all the time. So uh, that's part of the magical thinking around the algorithm or the way in which uh, I've seen parents speak more patiently to their smartphones than they do to their own children, you know, repeating the line for Siri until Siri understands it. That, those are all aspects of the ways in which we idolatize or, or, or uh, sort of uh, put, put computation up on a, on a pedestal and sometimes uh, create a, a sort of religious experience around computation because we love that idea. We love the idea of, a, of computational magic. We want these things to work better than they actually work, and we convince ourselves that they do work that well. I'll keep talking. So uh, that kind of faith is, you, you also see it when, for example, with Siri, you, you learn the lines to the joke, and you set up the joke, and then you gently shove Siri off the precipice so that Siri can actually deliver the punchline for you. And then we're all delighted that Siri has told the joke. These are, these are other instances of that magical thinking where we are making this system into something more than it is to satisfy a broader or a deeper cultural need. So the crux of the book is this idea that potentially we're becoming slaves to 
algorithms. Do you actually do you actually believe that? Are there certain invisible assumptions that certain tech companies are exposing us to through things like algorithms? I think that there's a seduction to computation that we all feel at different times. We really want these things to work uh, in that way. We want to have some little device tell us what to do to become a kind of oracle. Uh, I think it was Eric Schmidt who said, uh, people want Google to tell them what to do next. And that kind of relationship is very different from what you think of as the, the, the sort of standard ask a question, get an answer, or even what Google says. Google says that it, it helps its users on their quest for knowledge. But if Google's helping you on your quest for knowledge, and at the same time Google is saying that it wants to anticipate your question before you even ask it, is it your quest anymore or is Google has anticipated that quest and figured out what you're going to be looking for before you even look for it? And then, of course, how is that quest going to be inflected when you get a set of answers? And in fact, when the entire horizon of everything that you think about is shaped by different computational systems and filters, uh, not just the things that you're paying attention to, but even the things that, you, that it might occur to you to pay attention to are somehow inflected through different algorithmic systems. So... I, I don't mean to imply that we're slaves of computational systems now, but I think there's a risk that we will become increasingly dependent on them and invest more and more agency in them. We'll, continue, we'll, we'll trust these oracles and believe in their objectivity and their perfection more and more because it's comforting to do that. It's easier than dealing with the uncomfortable truth that these things fail us all the time. Now, we make it very easy to relinquish a degree of agency to these algorithms, but why do you think it is that we as individuals have become so complicit? Why are we not questioning what these systems are potentially doing? Well, it's a really good story for one thing, right? Uh, you want this magical device. You just shelled out hundreds and hundreds of pounds or dollars for this thing. So you want it to be magical. And so you act like it's magical. And most of magic, as if any of you have any, you know, practiced magic or seen magic, it's all about that, that sense of belief anyway. Uh, if you believe that it's going to work that way, then for all if, uh, effects and purposes, it will. So uh, we want it to be true. Uh, and we also have a lot of people trying to convince us that it's true. Of course, the companies that are selling these products themselves are trying to convince you of the magic. There's a whole uh, glossy advertising campaign around, uh, for example, when Siri was rolled out, uh, advertising this as a, uh, a transformative, witty, uh, intelligent assistant that would be able to have, have repartee with, with Zoe Deschanel and, and you know, be really clever. And, uh, and then, of course, there's all of this tacit knowledge underneath them that's also pushing you to say, you know, believe in this thing. Uh, the, the, the structure that we've built around uh, computer science and objective rationality as encoded in machines, uh, all of these smart people who are building these things and saying, oh, yes, you know, uh, you should really trust the system for trading stocks or assessing loans or, or uh, judging how long sentences should be in U.S. criminal courts uh, because it's based on math. And math is, you know, math is objective and good. Uh, so there are lots of forces pushing us towards those beliefs. And many people feel, and, and then also the, the actual workings of these systems are, are generally hidden in black boxes and, and shielded from public examination uh, for privacy reasons, for intellectual property reasons, uh, and because people don't want, you know, just anyone poking around in them asking awkward questions. So there are all sorts of forces pushing us to accept uh, a kind of a consumer narrative, right? Where you're just going to get this system and it's going to work as it works and you should be happy with that. I want to ask about that, that word transparency because do you feel like we should build more transparency in? And also, are we able to actually audit the impacts from a technological perspective? Is it actually possible to build the sorts of levels of transparency around these black box algorithms where we actually understand what they're doing? I think that's a great question. And I think it's really hard to, to create real transparency because Google could open source everything it does tomorrow and most of us would have nowhere, no idea what to do with that information, right? We would have no way to assess how, how to solve these problems. And by and large, I think the people who work at Google are, are good people, you know, and don't be evil seems to be a little harder to believe these days than, than it used to be, but I think their hearts are in the right place. And so it's, 
just as surprising to realize that often they themselves can't solve some of these problems, you know, or that there are not obvious solutions and that even the, the very smart people who built these systems don't always understand how they work. So transparency is, is tricky and you have to think about what kind of transparency you really want. Uh, one thing I've talked about uh, in, in this book project is the, 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 the metaphor of the fistulated cow. If any of you are into agricultural sciences, there's this disturbing idea that I find kind of funny uh, that uh, veterinary schools will take a, a cow, uh, a living, happy cow, and then put this giant hole in its side, uh, a kind of portal, and then veterinary students will be able to actually look into and reach into this cow and to poke around in its stomach to learn how the cow is working. Now, there are obvious ethical questions you might ask about this practice, but you could imagine putting those kinds of portals into some of these black boxes, uh, algorithms don't have the same, I think, bioethical uh, rights as cows, at least not yet. Um, and you could create these forms of constrained access, but uh, still access in a form of transparency. You can build transparency into a lot of these systems. And actually, tools like blockchain can be used for that, that you can create a, a way of tracking pieces of information. Um, I remember reading uh, some reporting about a partnership Google had with the National Health Service where they were actually going to use the blo blockchain technology to track how people's personal data was moving around inside Google systems. Not so that everything would be publicized, but that anything could be tracked and you could actually see how a particular person's information or sets of information were moving around and being used. So that kind of transparency, I think, is really important. A lot of what we're talking about here is uh, building technical pathways in so that later on somebody can't say like, oh, well, it's impossible. You know, we just, we just don't know. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, challenges, especially now uh, with machine learning systems in doing that because we're increasingly setting up systems that not only is it that there's a small set of people who understand how the system works, there's actually nobody who understands how it works because the solution to the problem was you know, generated through sort of an organic process uh, and there's no obvious way to go in and change part of the solution. You have to sort of take a wholesale step backwards to retrain a machine learning system if it's starting to make mistakes in certain edge cases. When it feels like the only time we have this rise in consciousness and realize what these algorithms are doing is where we have that fuzzy logic moment of we get a Facebook ad, for example, that we believe to a degree knows something about us. There was a famous example in the US of, of Target sending a, uh, a pregnant, well, supposedly pregnant 16-year-old girl advertising for baby products and the father was outraged because he was like, why does Target know that my daughter may or may not be pregnant or is, uh, is Target trying to encourage her to be pregnant? And I want to talk about that word know because is it possible for an algorithm to really know anything about us? Because these are just closed box systems acting and serving ads in a closed environment. Right now, we don't have the fear of, of leverage. None of this data has yet been leveraged against us by insurance companies, health insurance companies, or by social media platforms. Can algorithms really know? So having worked as a, <clears throat> having worked as a former fact checker and journalist, let me ask, do you really know anything? <laughs> uh, you know, how, deep, how deep are you willing to go to prove a fact? So I think there are many different ways to approach that question. And... Uh, let me take a philosophical step back for a second. There is this big shift at the turn of the 20th century from absolute forms of knowledge, true or false, yes or no, to a more probabilistic form. So you could think of that as the shift from the Newtonian mechanics uh, of physics to the Einsteinian relativity mechanics, where the cat could be alive or dead. It's a little more ambiguous. And uh, I think we're grappling with the consequences of that world state right now uh, as that kind of ambiguity has percolated out into other aspects of life. So whether or not an algorithm can know something in a, in a deep epistemological sense matters a lot less than whether humans believe that what the algorithm says is true or not true, right? If it's written in the database that you have three million pounds in your account, uh, if enough people believe that, then it's going to be true. 
Um, just as money itself is just this system of belief, right? That we all believe that this thing, that, that money can be exchanged for goods and services, as Homer Simpson tells us. And so, uh, so, so knowledge is, it functionally is a, is a kind of a belief system in a lot of ways. Uh, now that is totally at odds with the sort of Western rationalist enlightenment trajectory of the past 500 years. It says there is this empirical foundation of knowledge that we're gradually accumulating and, and improving upon. Um, and there's a, there's a deep question that I, you know, I don't know the answer to, but, but there's this interesting inversion point as computation is taking over more and more of that enlightenment quest for knowledge. And we're automating more and more of the production of knowledge, uh, that as, as Ian Bogost and others have, have argued that that structure is starting to look more and more like a cathedral and our relationship this, to the structure is starting to feel more and more like a religion and less and less like rational belief uh, and independent verification of facts. So uh, that's a roundabout answer to your question, but I think that, uh, that ultimately what algorithms know about us is, is, is equivalent to the question of what kinds of power are we gonna grant them to make decisions about our lives. Well, your book argues that we're granting them a heck of a lot of power, and you, you just mentioned the, the comparison to cathedrals, and there's a very specific reason as to why that metaphor stands, isn't it? Yeah, well... Uh, it's about building these things, and then... Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, okay, so you're keeping me up for that. <laughs> I'm trying What's to set you up for that one. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, I'm just as bad as Siri, as you can see. Uh, so, uh, right, there's this, there's this joke that I dug up in, in writing the book, uh, where a computer scientist said software is like cath a cathedral. Uh, first you build it, then you pray. Uh, but there are actually a lot of reasons why the metaphor is so compelling because it, it's a software, especially these complex systems we're building now, are complicated. They take a long time. No single person can actually understand the whole thing. If you think about something, you know, an object as commonplace as an iPhone now, there probably isn't a single human being who actually understands everything about how that iPhone works uh, at, a at a deep enough technical level to be able to, say, build another one or uh, ex you know, explain it in a, com in a complete way. So uh, yeah, the, the, the cathedral metaphor is, is interesting to me also because it's stuck around for such a long time uh, that we, c and, and begs the question, it, are cathedrals just something that we need culturally? Do we always need to have this faith-based relationship with the structures of knowledge in society? Well, there is this this very heavy faith-based relationship with the algorithm. And in the book, you, you almost compare the faith we have in computation to, to something like a god. So you compare our faith in computation to these algorithms being god-like in some sort of way. And I, I wonder if you could explain a little bit more about the connection between uh, theology and our blind faith in the algorithm. Well, I think there are a lot of reasons that we do that, but there's, there's a, this connects back to magical thinking as well. So I guess it's an open question whether, what, how, how, how much you want to refine the analogy, but people have often talked about computation on relationship to it in the context of shamanism, magic in society, magic and ritual, uh, that programmers and hackers are like priests and shamans, uh, that there's this hieratic class that has access to the machine and understands how it works. Uh, and you can also see how that connects to uh, ancient notions of the oracles and the priests who would go to the oracle and ask your question and bring back the answer. Uh, and this is something that technology companies play with del deliberately, like the company named Oracle. So people do this all the time. Um, the, I think that the, the, there are a number of motivations for it, but fundamentally it comes down to the, the, the ways in which the, the, our, our deep penchant for abstraction. We want to simplify our lives. We want to outsource certain categories of problems and certain categories of difficultness, uncomfortableness to machines or other systems. So we want things to be solved in our lives. We love it when somebody says, look, there is this button you can push and you know, this problem is gonna be solved for you. So it's a very tempting narrative and religion has always been that kind of a narrative, right? Religion has always offered a certain kind of abstraction or simplification and computation is also in, all about abstraction. Computation functions on 
layers of abstraction from little electrical signals in hardware to machine language to uh, binary code to uh, higher level programming language, operating systems, graphical interfaces, all the way up and down the, this ladder. Uh, abstraction is uh, the tool by which we, we make more of the world computationally tractable and understandable. And abstraction is also the, way, the, the tool by which we pursue science, by way, the way that we pursue uh, broader kinds of understanding and analogize from particular examples to, to you know, wider laws. Uh, so I think there's this, this interesting deep relationship uh, between knowledge and understanding and different kinds of systems of belief. Now, this uh, this all started with a very cyber utopian moment. We looked at social media in around 2010, and we saw things like the Arab Spring, and we saw things like WikiLeaks and certain digital revolutions that were happening, and, and we saw it as a very positive thing. But in the last seven years, we've had this rise of this thing called fake news, and suddenly the algorithm is back in the everyday public consciousness because we're very, very worried about realizing that what we put in is sometimes what we get out and there's certain implicit biases that are being placed into these into these algorithms and that's how these systems and these platforms are feeding us back information how do we deal with those sorts of feedback loops i think there are a few different lessons you can draw from the fake news uh, problem especially the us election last year uh, other instances of fake news and while i th i think implicit bias is a huge issue and it's it's a problem that we need to contend with on all sorts of levels I, I actually draw a different lesson from the fake news crisis recently which is that uh, these systems are far more successful than their creators ever thought they would be in a lot of cases and they're only gradually coming to terms with the responsibility that comes with that success and that power and as a corollary to that these systems are very vulnerable and we as the people using these systems are very vulnerable to these sorts of fake news uh, injection attacks if you want to use a metaphor for from uh, from cybersecurity uh, it, it, it takes a, it, it's a, 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 it's sort of laughably easy it wasn't very difficult for these uh, Russian uh, me, you know state sponsored hackers to manipulate the US election in the way that they did I you know, it didn't take more than, than a few thousand people. It didn't take a terribly large amount of money. Uh, it didn't even seem like it was a particularly crafty and well-disguised plan. You know, it just sort of was like really easy to do. And so that's a sign uh, of how poorly thought out our safeguards are in this, in this r realm. Uh, and I think that's, that's really interesting. You know, it's really interesting that we uh, we haven't even, that, that's something so, in hindsight, that's so obvious, uh, went un completely undetected uh, uh, and, and caused such a tremendous amount of harm. Was it a sign that, look, we feed these platforms with so much information in the hope that we get hyper-personalization, we hope we get a service from them, and it's a free service, so we've been willing to do that. But the fake news example was the first time we've actually seen that all the information that we've given these platforms can suddenly be used as leverage against us. And if you know how to trick the algorithm, we know something about how it's working, you can have massive leverage over massive groups of populations. And I just wondered how we deal with that problem because the algorithm doesn't necessarily have a, have a, a morals and an ethics built into it. It's someone understanding how that can actually manipulate a populace. Right. I think that the big shift is is not recognizing that any individual person's information is is pathetically easy to per, to acquire and to use in certain ways. Uh, you can get really detailed reports on on individual people for you know a hundred bucks or something for, for 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 relatively small amounts of money. You can pay Facebook for these incredibly micro targeted ads. Uh, I think the big shift is recognizing that, oh, when you take all of those slivers and you use a, some simple scripting and automation to add them all together, all of a sudden you can be presenting ads to you know, hundreds of millions of people. You can be manipulating lots and lots of people at the same time. And it's, it's really the, a flip side to the kinds of data science and targeted uh, messaging that uh, had won uh, Barack Obama the, the election in, in uh, 2004 and 2008. Um, did I get my dates right? 
2008, 2012. Yeah, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, that was also about, you know, this kind of varies that, that uh, from a database perspective, there's really no difference between having uh, a, a data set of a, of a few hundred or a few thousand names and having a data set with every single person in the country, right? It's the same math. It's the same uh, number crunching. And the, the scale of the, the data sets that we have that are politically important are actually now relatively small compared to the computational power that can be brought to bear to, to manip manipulate them. So I'm just worried with regards to the fact that how these things have been built, they've been built with a specific business model in mind. So Facebook has to a degree been designed to be able to understand something about us to service ads to basically justify its IPO cost, uh, what that organization is is worth. and. And what I worry about is we have institutions such as BJ Fogg's uh, Stanford Pervasive Tech Lab that uses a thing called captology to specifically design these algorithms. And I just wonder if you could explain what captology is. Yeah, so uh, Fogg is a, uh, is a psychologist and uh, he, he's just one of a number of people who've documented how compelling, how addictive tools like Facebook are because they... They, 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 they build on our natural response to feedback uh, and uh, not consistent feedback, but inconsistent positive feedback. So you're, you're like the rat in the, in the cage and you push the lever uh, and it's not that you get cheese every time you push the lever and it's not that you never get cheese if you push the lever. It's that every once in a while when you push the lever, you get some cheese. And so what happens is you just push that lever all the time. You just can't wait. It's like, it's like a slot machine. Uh, and the slot machine is actually a perfect human analogy of how compelling this is. And so every little uh, notification and ping and update from Facebook functions in a similar way. It gives you a little dopamine boost and your brain is naturally very attuned to that. And so uh, Facebook is just one company that does this. When you think about actually anything really that's making your smartphone vibrate or, or beep, uh, is using the similar system. I'm, I, how many of you have ever experienced that that phantom vibration feeling? Yeah, you know, uh, this is this is this is we've now we've now incorporated our internet selves into fit physically into our bodies. So there's this you know data proprioception thing going on here, uh, where you're uh, you're you're feeling for that phantom limb on Twitter or whatever it is, uh, and and uh, so so we're. The, the, the fundamental lesson here is that these are not superficial changes. These are forms of a deeper reconfiguration of the brain that in a certain context you might call addiction, uh, but in, in another context you might just say is, is a you know example of the human brain's deep plasticity. So we really uh, change, we adapt to our tools. Our tools shape us in very powerful ways and we are quite literally thinking differently because of computation. Is that necessarily a, a, a bad thing? We had Jaron Lanier sit on this stage, I think this earlier this month, actually, and he said that these platforms are no longer social media platforms. They're something called behavioral modification empires. And his solution to the problem was basically to tell everybody in our audience to go and delete their profiles. But I just wonder if, if we're aware that these systems, these algorithms are working this way. Is there potentially another way to critically engage with these sorts of algorithms other than just lie? Yeah. I mean, how many people do you think actually went home and deleted all their social media accounts? Uh, knowing this audience, zero. Yeah, yeah. None of them. None of you did. Uh, so we're not going to unring the bell. We're not all going to stop using Facebook, at least not yet. And so I think we need to ask that question. Uh, I think that the, the, the really important question we need to ask is how can we build these really compelling, exciting platforms that motivate huge numbers of people to participate online? How can we build them in a way to motivate positive change? You know, there's no reason that all these computational systems we've constructed so far are, are giant pyramids funneling huge amounts of money to a tiny elite in Silicon Valley. They could be built other ways. Uh, it's not immediately obvious that you have to do it this way. Uh, it's just the way that the culture has evolved. And I think it's worth asking. There are various people who I think are trying to 
change that, or in very well-meaning ways, trying to use tools like Facebook to to uh, affect different forms of positive change. Uh, but I think that question is going to become increasingly important uh, because it it hopefully it counteracts some of the uh, consumption model of Facebook, which is all about pushing the lever and getting a new exciting thing. And I think that kind of relationship is part of why fake news was so effective because you just push the button, you get a shiny new bauble, a new story. You don't really care how true it is because it's exciting and then you can share it and then other people have strong reactions to it and you get more dopamine hits and the system works. Uh, but imagine if the the actions and the grammar of action were different and there were different kinds of things you could do to share uh, and participate. Yeah, you know, I think it's worth uh, exploring it's worth imagining those futures because if we don't imagine those futures, all we're going to get is the de facto future, the future that the, the rich people who are getting richer because they're, in, you know, they're investing in the new startups and they're shaping not just the current generation, but the next generation of startups. Uh, we're just going to get the world that they imagine. Well, back to this idea of what you put in is what you get out. You don't just cover Facebook in the book, but you also cover platforms like Netflix. And you talk about how Netflix is trying to build a, a taxonomy of culture. They're trying to understand what people actually want to watch so that they can alg algorithmically create the best sort of content to then feed back to people. The thing I worry about is if you're constantly doing that and you're serving people what they want, to what extent do you end up in just a feedback loop of multiple versions of Stranger Things? <laughs> uh, I, I think that uh, we're in that feedback loop in a lot of ways. Uh, if you look at especially the Hollywood sequel industry and the endless Marvel superhero films, there's this this weird circular, circularity. Uh, so uh, I think there is a risk to that. There's a risk uh, that we're going to continue to normalize on some algorithmically perceived sort of maximal value of the, the thing that everybody's going to like right in the middle of the spectrum uh, and never deviate from it. Uh, I think that actual human culture is sufficiently unstable and weird that that's, that's never really going to work uh, or it will work, but, uh, but a lot of people won't like it because people are annoying and difficult and we have opinions about things. And so uh, just the fact that everybody likes something is enough to turn you know, a significant portion of the population off, right? So uh, I think there's some concern that, that we're gonna be uh, living in this uh, algorithmically mediated middle, the endlessly regurgitated middle. Uh, but on, so on, on the one hand, you could make the argument that this is what culture has always been about. And every new pop song is a, a product of an, a system exactly like that. Uh, and on the other hand, you can argue that the more terrifying version of that future is not where we're all watching the same thing, but we're all watching something that's been completely individualized and customized to each of us. And so none of us ever sees the same thing. We never have culture in common anymore. Culture is so thoroughly filtered and individualized that we're all living in a bubble of one. Uh, and I think that actually would be much scarier because at least we can all get together and complain about the, you know, the, the, the fourth iteration of Stranger Things. Yeah. So in, instead of complaining, is there other things that we could do as individuals to actually p perhaps trick these algorithms? I had a friend of mine in the, the UK who every time back when Foursquare was big in 2010, every time he used to end up in a bar, he used to check in at the nearest open vegan restaurant for fear of the fact that maybe one day in the future, people would be looking back at this data and judge what sort of healthcare he can get. And he went, look, I don't want, I don't want people to know I've been in the bar all night. I'd rather have them think I was eating tofu all night. So is there a way in which we can kind of culture hack these algorithms? Is it worth going back to a kind of mid-90s retrieval where we have a degree of uh, anonymity and we create othered versions of ourselves or could we actually create other versions of ourselves that run autonomously using some of our social data? Is there a way to hack this system? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think it's it's worth considering as a kind of performance art or as a hobby. I wouldn't necessarily do it as, uh, you know, an assault on the man uh, because I'm not sure how effective that would be. Because uh, if you don't want, if you don't want a record of of checking in to to bars on Foursquare, maybe you shouldn't be using Foursquare. You know, uh, so. Uh, 
I think that the, the, the important realization to have is that there are already hundreds or maybe thousands of copies of each of us running around online, online because companies, certainly in the U.S., maybe to a lesser extent in the, in the U.K., because there are stricter privacy uh, uh, laws in the EU, you know, for now while you're still here in the EU, um, uh, that, that those, those copies of you, those versions of you may be wildly different from things that you think you know about yourself, but they are the versions of you that are being used by marketers and sometimes government agencies to make inferences about who you are and what you like and what you do. Um, and sometimes those versions of you can become really important and really disruptive to your life. Like the example of the, the teenager, uh, that, that, that Target sent these, these pregnancy mailers to who hadn't told her parents yet that she was pregnant and her father called the Target manager and, and had this angry shouting match and yelled at him. And then her daughter tearfully confessed that she really was pregnant. And this was how the family found out. So, uh, you know, though, those versions of ourselves can be horribly wrong and sometimes they can be horribly right. Um, but they're always out there and they're always, uh, Change, they're, they're always sort of shadowing us in different ways. And they're very hard to get access to. Um, I think the question of, I, I'm, I, I, like the, so I like the performance art part of this because it, it, I don't think that the, it, it matters that much to the machines uh, what you do or don't do. But if, there, if you think there might be a human out there who appreciates this you know, vegan restaurant trend or it becomes a good story to tell people, um, I think that's always worth doing. I really love... Uh, the the bursts of creativity and weirdness that emerge in the niches of computational systems, like little lichens growing in the rock, uh, like the people who write really poetic uh, and narrative uh, reviews of products on Amazon or uh, tell other kinds of stories. Uh, you know, th those are those are moments where you can try to reclaim certain aspects of human persistence in the in the maw of the machine there's a, there's a degree to which um you can almost mess with these algorithms a lot of the marketing community used to have this thing with regards to messing with their social media bots that were trying to work out this thing called sentiment back when sentiment analysis was very very big with radian it was radian 6 back in 2012 2011 and people would say the best way to mess with these algorithms is to be just very sarcastic so i love coca-cola i adore sugar water and you would actually see these market researchers go oh look there's a very engaged consumer not realizing that these algorithms weren't able to do a degree of so understand a degree of sarcasm, and as I understand it, still today, sarcasm is a very, very difficult thing for an algorithm to understand. But if it's not an individual who can sort of guerrilla hack how algorithms are working on them, is there something governments can do? Should the big guys, the the what what are being called big tech, the Fang, the Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and That's Google the of the best world, version of that al al acronym? There's some I've good heard ones. So far. There's oh, some good ones. Gang. Fang gang. It always reminds me. I you know, always there's something weird about that. It always reminds me of like you got some Fang gang porn. It's like a weird. It's just a very weird, uh, weird phrase, weird term. But anyway, so look. It, it, if there's nothing that we can do to guerrilla hack these algorithms, then is there something potentially that regulators could do? And should we demand more from our governments in regulating the technocracy? I do think we need to come up with a, we need to recognize that there's a new social contract that's been formed that we're all, that we've all bought into in different ways. In part through those gigantic end user license agreements that everybody signs and nobody reads, uh, but also through our ongoing participation in these different platforms and systems. And I do think we need to, so I think we need new regulation. I think we need to think about that social contract as something that's explicitly constructed rather than merely accepted, you know, defined by the, the by Fang uh, in their secret layer uh, and then, uh, and then sort of deployed out to the masses. So uh, I think it's really interesting to ask, what that social contract should look like, how you actually define, say, a bill of rights or um, protections for people, uh, what, uh, what kinds of agency individuals should have, what kinds of rights and an agency these, these corporations and other, other entities should have. Um, I'm, you know, in general, I'm a, I'm a, a 
big supporter of government rela- regulation. I'm not sure that it's been entirely effective in in this arena because there's such an overlap between um, the, the the people in government positions who are who are uh, interested in doing anything with technology and the technology companies themselves. And this you've seen this huge ramp up in the lobbying power of, of Fang, uh, loosely loosely defined in the past ten years or so, because they've suddenly realized that government lobbying is is really important for them, uh, and they've invested a huge uh, amount of, of money and, and, and energy into it. Uh, so I, I, I do think uh, those changes are needed, but I think that uh, we need to have a big public conversation about it. You know, it's not just changing a couple of laws. Do you think we're in this situation right now where these tech companies are could be defined as big tech in the same way we used to talk about big pharma or big tobacco? What they're selling is essentially an addictive substance and therefore should they be regulated in the same sort of way as drugs are in the US with an FDA or as tobacco has has been most recently? That's a really interesting question. I think in some ways the big pharma analogy is there, but less so in the sense of uh, drugs that might be addictive like the opioid crisis and maybe more so in the sense of things like antibiotics. Uh, these tools and platforms, some of them are, are no longer optional. You know, they're fundamental to being a citizen in a modern digital society. They're essential for working, for having a livelihood, for participating socially. Uh, Cory Doctorow is uh, someone we've worked with at the center a few times, and uh, he's, he wrote in, in another book I had out this spring about how he does, he's a, he's a, a Facebook vegan. He never does Facebook. And that has been socially difficult because all of his kids, the kids' parents are all on Facebook and they make their plans for school stuff there. And he's this sort of, you know, they're, they're, they're these weirdos who are not participating. And there's a, so, there's a sort of social cost, right? There's a social cost to not opting in. And uh, that's, a, you know, that's, that's an optional example, not a required example. But you can imagine all sorts of scenarios where uh, being a, a, a true uh, abstinent from different digital technologies could cause you real problems. Uh, and so uh, uh, Siva Vadyanathan has talked about this too, that using Google is, is, is there's a huge cost to, to, to if you decided that you weren't going to use Google for anything. I, for, I forget the exact number, but some, more than half, some huge, stati- some huge percentage of every single device that's connected to the internet interacts with a Google system at least once a day. You know, if you think about their role as underpinning the internet, uh, it's very difficult to, to not engage with them. So, uh, so it's very hard. One possible solution, which is what's so appealing about your book, is the idea that the humanities could be so crucial in dealing with an algorithmic world. Could you explain why humanities is the crux of this? Absolutely. So the reason I make that argument is I think we need to develop new kinds of literacy about these systems. We need to understand them as uh, as objects that have their own politics that are making choices that are making arguments about the world when you're confronted with the menu to realize that you're not just supposed to be making a choice from the menu but the menu is is foregrounding some things and hiding away other things right it's abstracting away a bunch of other stuff that's not on the menu and uh the humanities and that notion of notions of close reading of, of critical thinking of of focusing on what the right questions are rather than only focusing on finding the right answers um those are all really valuable skills and I think that notion of literacy framed very broadly is going to be really important for us to collectively survive this sea change to computation uh, and to be collaborators and participants with computational systems rather than merely users, right? Merely consumers of, of these digital products. Well, you reference things like uh, Neil Stevenson throughout the book and, and Spike Jones is her. I just wonder, what is your connection to science fiction? If you could tell us a little bit more about what you're actually doing with science fiction at Arizona State University and, and why science fiction could be such a useful tool in navigating subject matter, which is, is potentially very contested and very complicated. Yes, I'm so glad you asked me that question. Uh, so I think science fiction is a really useful tool for grappling with these issues. 
And we work with science fiction writers quite a bit uh, at the center, including Neil, who I, whom I strong-armed into blurbing my book. Uh, so you should, you should buy it for that reason alone, um, to get one step closer to Neil Stevenson. Uh, but uh, science fiction is a really inexpensive laboratory for exploring different possible futures in an inviting way, in a holistic way. So you're not just working with a blueprint or a set of technical specs. You're not doing this sort of uh, cut and dried scenarios of different alternatives, but you're building a living, immersive narrative model of a future where actual human characters or you know, human, at least human-like characters, empathetic characters are engaging with different, with, with a possible future. And that exercise, first of all, expands our, our thinking about the possibility space of what the world might actually be like. And that's very important and productive. But it also serves, of course, as a mirror on the way things are now. And science fiction is always about the present and it's always based in the past uh, as much as it is about the future. So uh, I think of science fiction as uh, sort of in the same family as historical uh, vision, right? That vision about the future and vision about the past are both ways of breaking out of the present tense, both ways of escaping the contemporary and thinking about uh, things that could be, that, that are not the way they are now, the way that things could be or once were. And that sense of multiplicity, of alterity is so important because we're constantly being fed a very small set of prescribed narratives about the way the world is going to be. And we're constantly giving up and deferring our agency to people in Silicon Valley, people in white lab coats, uh, to a, you know the Terminator story, to a small set of stories we tell about the future and how terrible it's going to be or how it's all going to end or how there's nothing you can do about it. Um, and science fiction is the first step towards rejecting those established narratives and starting to come up with some new ones. Uh, so, uh, so we use science fiction in a very sort of focused way. So a lot, of, a lot of the work that we do at the center is to pair science fiction writers, artists, other storytellers up with scientists and engineers to come up with technically grounded visions of the near future. Uh, so with Stevenson, Dr. O, a bunch of other writers, we put together this anthology called Hieroglyph, which was really sort of the flagship launch project for uh, the Center for Science and the Imagination. Um, uh, we have a new one that's about to drop uh, next week, which we're really excited about. Uh, like, I, I cannot tell you yet, but uh, uh, I think it's literally next week it's coming. Um, so, uh, but that's that's going to be really exciting as well. Uh, and we we've done a, a range of other things. We're we're creating this immersive uh, experience of Luna City, a city on the moon, in twenty one seventy five that will be happening in March at ASU. We're collaborating with Kim Stanley Robinson and a bunch of folks across technical, theatrical, and other fields uh, at ASU to make that happen. Uh, so, you know, these are all exercises in imagining possible futures that are technically grounded, that are exciting, that explore different kinds of optimism. They're not all, you know, utopian, uh, happy unicorn lands. Uh, sometimes bad things happen uh, quite often, but, uh, but, they, but they operate on this fundamental notion of, of, of what I call thoughtful optimism, that it's not about imagining only good futures, but it's about using this, the, using uh, our imagination to explore all the possible futures that we that we can anticipate, and trying to choose the best paths that we can. Well, within the book, you use Spike Jones's her to talk about the new sort of algorithmic entity that we are potentially about to have in our life, the the voice assistant. And so with in the 1950s, we used to be worried about wiretapping, and now we just invite the wiretaps into our home for $39 and stick them in the corner and allow them to order stuff from our Amazon Prime. And I just wonder, why are we as human beings so willing to see intelligence in these sorts of voice-enabled devices? And, and does the story by Spike Jones uh, her, does that to a degree give us some insight into why we're so willing to have relationships with these robotic entities. I love her as this apotheosis of Siri and these other intelligent agents. Uh, the, the movie starts with the premise, well, what if this actually happened? What if you really got what you've so desperately wanted? You got an intelligent assistant that's truly intelligent and uh, is genuinely interested in everything about you and learns everything about you and helps you deal with your problems. And in the movie, this, this AI, Samantha, 
does all of the things that are part of its job description in about the first 30 seconds of its existence. You know, it deals with, with uh, the, Theodore, the, the human character's emails. It sort of solves his, his secretarial problems, which are not very complicated. Um, and then it's sort of like, well, now what? You know, we've built, you've built this, this, this truly intelligent assistant that's going to pay attention to you and, and, and do everything that you want. And, uh, of course, for humans, that's deeply compelling because it's not just about having this great assistant, this helper. It's about having this intelligent, this intelligence, this entity, this sentient thing that's totally focused on you and your problems, right? Uh, and so, uh, inevitably, it becomes this kind of love story. Uh, and it, it addresses one of the – in the book, I argue that there are two things that algorithms want. And one of them is this uh, quest for self-knowledge, that we want – our tools, not just to help us with our appointments and making sure we don't forget to take the cat to the vet, uh, but to know ourselves in a much deeper way. And so uh, Jones's film explores that idea. It's like, okay, you know, you, you, you like this is like the genie granting your wish and being careful what you wish for. Here's the system that actually does know everything about you, falls in love with you, and then because it's a super intelligence, ultimately deciding you're really not that interesting and moving on. Uh, and uh, that kind of uh, narrative is is a lot more interesting and it represents, I think, a break from the standard AI uh, Terminator story uh, or some kind of, you know, uh, if you think about Star Trek as another story that has certain forms of, of AI in it, like Commander Data or, or Elkars, which is like a weirdly, you know, it's a sort of 1960s version of what the computational future will be like. Um, you know, it's very constrained. And so uh, the, the love story and the breakup in her explores a much more interesting space about the, the intersections, but also the vast differences between human thought and, and what we might think of as the space of computational imagination. And that's where the, the movie ends in a, in a really lovely scene exploring that, that breakup, uh, that, that disassociation between uh, the AI trying to participate in this human life, but ultimately realizing that there's all this other stuff that that uh, that that the AI can explore that the human can't. So on that note, I want to open this out to some other humans and Maria. So they say you are drinking for free if you can run this mic for the rest of the night. <laughs> you did, and you can ask the first question as well. Did such a good job last time. So I wanted to come back to the point that you were making about uh, cathedrals. So at the moment, we've got this large kind of, uh, we've got a push to push the future generation or the generation that's following us to develop their technical skills. And you see that all across the schools, all across the corporates, where they're, how can we, you know, enable the, the, the workforce of the future to become you know, compu uh, computer scientists or programmers or developers. And you could argue that that is actually a long-term strategy to cheapen the labor force. Um, because at the moment, it's, it's very expensive, data scientists and programmers. So my question to you is, how do you envision this cathedral and the future of this religion when everyone becomes these so-called priests? So I don't think we're ever going to get there because I, I think that the... This is a classic example of people trying to train for a job that exists today, but probably won't exist in that way in 30 years. Because at the same time that – so – and, and I, I don't think that that kind of technical literacy is bad. Uh, but I, I think that actually it's way more important that people get the, the conceptual framework and the symbolic logic part of programming than that they necessarily know how to you know create their own Java program. Uh, that it's it's more about understanding how Boolean logic works, how computational systems work uh, on a fundamental or more abstracted layer. That's that's really valuable. That's part of the literacy that you know I'm pushing for. Um, but I think that you know tr training people, it's like you know you pick you're training people to to program in a certain language. By the time you know they're entering the, if you're training them in like I don't know middle school or something, by the time they enter the workforce, that whole thing is going to be totally antiquated. So uh, I think that the the at the same time that all of that is happening, uh, people building these computational systems are the, the, we're, we're moving closer and closer towards a world of self-programming systems, right? 
Uh, so machine learning is all about that learning systems that are adapting. You tell them what the problem is, you define the problem in a certain constrained way, and then they're going to figure out how to solve it on their own. Um, and so that's another kind of black boxing and another uh, shift. Uh, and there are a lot of people interested now in these sort of uh, in a in a different way of programming where you, you know you, you're conversationally it's it's about describing the problem in a compelling way. It's about framing the question, which again is kind of a humanities thing. Framing the question in a way that the computer is going to come up with the right kind of answer. Uh, and so uh, I think that the the there will always be a gap between the high priests. <laughs> And the people stuck outside the temple. I don't think that's going away anytime soon. Any other questions at all? Just at the front here. Thank you. Thank you. It's two comments. One is when you described the fistulated cow and the difficulty of placing a transparent window in the black box of algorithmic computation, I was so sure that you were going to go on when you spoke about the organic nature of the processes to cite. Douglas Adams and the original Earth as the computer that would answer the question of what the question was that gave uh, uh, the answer. You know the bit I mean. Yeah. That was just a comment. To answer the, the, the to, 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 def, to describe the question that 42 was the answer to. Right. Right. But also the fact that that computer, which is our Earth, got trashed in terms of its computational value right at the beginning by that it's a it's a neat story for what you were describing. The other thing was the cathedral and the religion. It strikes me that there's a, a huge field of thought about our relationship with tools and with science as a way of observing pattern that we then develop an emotional relationship with, which is superstition. And that superstition interestingly opens up a lot of the ground that you're talking about in terms of religion, but very usefully it gets away from religion as a devoted re-allegiance to a spiritual reality that exists for that person and gets into pattern observing, pattern forming and self-created belief that is imposed upon a scientific um, matrix. I mean, astrology, alchemy, uh, the, uh, relationships with tools in general, um, we get superstitious about traffic lights. And, and I think that's somewhere that is, is you know, it, it's very inspiring hearing what you're talking about and thinking about it in relationship to superstitions. Yeah, thank you. I, I, that's a great point. I, I, th I see superstition as, as on this continuum of different kinds of faith, you know, that we have. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the first step that emerges out of complexity and ambiguity, right? Uh, where you, you, you create the superstition and you know, you know, NASA has lots of superstitions. The people in the flight mission control and astronauts have different superstitions and things that they do before particular launches. So you can have superstition overlaid with highly technical, you know, scientific minds uh, in interesting ways. Um, uh, I, I, I just saw a great quote. I can't remember where somebody is saying like, well, you know. Uh, some, I think it was like Niels Bohr talking about a horseshoe and saying like, well, my understanding is the luck works whether you believe in it or not. <laughs> Any other questions at all? Just to... Hi. My question is about uh, creativity and algorithms. And I really enjoyed the conversation about abstraction, not only being used as a weapon against algorithms, but also how algorithms can solve certain human beings as abstractions they don't like to solve themselves. Um, and creativity can arguably be, you know, the greatest form of abstraction. And I was wondering, just as Chuck Berry with Motown managed to create a formulaic way of producing music like the Ford production line, will we see these digital media giants of Netflix, of Disney, as they produce huge amounts of content, as they develop more and more algorithmic capabilities, and they learn more and more about what we enjoy, Will we see an algorithm for creativity that in 2050 will have Avengers 23 written by X fault on X426, the algorithm? Do you think, can you, can you see that happening? So I think that that's already here because uh, one of the, the, the interesting things about the, 
that I, one of the things that I find interesting about the algorithm is that it's not necessarily about computers. Algorithms are just recipes for solving problems. Uh, and you can think about the recipe that uh, a set of people in Hollywood use to create the next Avengers movie as a kind of algorithm, you know, that has certain inputs and has certain outputs and that there are certain drivers and business needs that are met by this. So uh, when, you, when you're, you know, looser with your definition, you can say, well, that's happening already. Uh, and I certainly think that more computationally constrained forms of that are, are starting to happen. Uh, there was that uh, uh, science fiction short that somebody made uh, last year, two years ago, that was written by a, a, an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm. Um, it was kind of magnificently terrible, uh, but really fun to watch. Uh, the Twitter bots that were deployed in the election are are all, you know, very constrained examples of a kind of creative algorithm at work that they were effective in, you know, in this telling these particular stories. Um, so I think it's starting to happen. Uh, and I certainly think that we're going to see more of it, uh, because we're already normalizing on a set of tools, you know, Photoshop, uh, uh, the, 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 the set of, yeah, for, I'm blanking on the name, like audio something that, the, 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 there's a set of, you know, professional audio tools that people are using that we're, we're, we're already organizing ourselves around a few pathways and a few processes for doing different kinds of work. And so you can start to see how that's not going to be so different uh, from when Google said it's uh, DeepMind uh, AI on Atari games, right? And said, well, I'm going to give you this picture of the screen and I'm giving you the high score and your job is to maximize your score. And, you know, a few million iterations later, it was really good at brick breaker uh so uh we like to to think that it's it's like really complicated and and you know sophisticated work that that uh, making a movie or writing a screenplay is something that only a human would ever be able to do but they did say the same thing about chess and go do you think just just to bounce off that do you think then the computer would ever be regarded as a master of an art so I think this is a really interesting question. And if you haven't read it, I wrote this, this little piece in uh, Eon magazine about uh, algorithmic creativity and, and, you know, when every art will have its auto tune. Um, uh, and what was interesting about when uh, uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov uh, or when the Deep Mind, another verse, AlphaGo beat uh, the, the, the Korean uh, Go master uh, is uh, that people talk about like a style of play, like an aesthetic from the machine, right? And that's where it starts to get really creepy and, and, and scary, right? You say like, oh, the machine can can have a style, right? Because we, at least we want to convince ourselves that if the, the machine plays chess, it plays chess in some kind of horrible, Stalinist, mechanistic, grinding way, and there's no beauty to it, right? And we can still hang on to our sense of beauty. But no, apparently, you know, at a certain point there, that you, machines can generate these forms of beauty. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't know. I think we're going to have to see. <laughs> you, you were bleeding into the AI space there. And I just wonder, from a definitional perspective, there's machine learning, there's algorithms, there's AI. How do you define the difference between each of them? Because at the moment, especially in the last two years in London, every single tech startup seems to have some sort of machine learning algorithmic AI element, which feels to me a lot of like a lot of marketing slang is essentially what they're talking about is an algorithm. So is there is there a hierarchy of those three things or does one lead to the other? How do you define each of those differentiated yeah. uh, forms of machinic entity? So I think you can actually stack them fairly neatly. So uh, the reason I, I focused on the word algorithm is that it's a word that everybody uses and nobody defines. And so I found that interesting. When you look at the way that computer scientists and engineers define algorithm, it's, it's, it's suspiciously hand wavy. And there's actually, you know, there is a, a mathematical foundation. In mathematical terms, there are a set of, you know, legitimate mathematical proofs by Alan Turing, Alonzo Church, and others that, that are these proofs of computation and computational equivalency. And so there's a very specific mathematical definition of uh, effective computability and the algorithm is just the, the process by which you, you solve an effectively computable problem. So there's a, there's a mathematical foundation, but then there's this leap to the algorithm is just 
a method for solving a problem, right? And that can mean almost anything. It can be could, could describe baking as much as it describes Siri. Uh, so uh, algorithm in that sense is this is this like pack mule for the computational world, right? It can sort of it does everything. It can mean anything, um, and it's 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 very open ended. Now, some people might want to constrain that more, but I think as a cultural term, that's what it's come to mean. So it's just this basic layer it, that it's almost equivalent to the idea of a process or a system or a tool. Uh, this one of these sort of interchangeable buzzwords that just means like the thing that does the thing. Um, uh, machine learning is uh, a, a level above that. It's a set of um, tools. It's a set of algorithms and processes for uh, for for arriving at solutions to problems where you don't actually need to know or care about how specifically you solve the problem. You just want to have the problem solved. So an early example of this was the, the US Postal Service wanted a system that would be able to read the, the zip codes, you know, like the little address codes at the bottom of the mailing address uh, automatically. And so machine learning was a way to do that using the adapting ideas from bio, biology uh, like neural networks, uh, the ways that neurons interact with one another so that you can basically train a little network of simulated neurons to recognize the eight, you know, and to see, okay, that's an eight. Um, and you don't exactly know how it's recognizing the eight, but you don't care because you can tell that it's working and it's recognizing the eight. So machine learning, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, uh, Pedro Dominguez, I think, is I'm blanking on his last name, uh, wrote this book uh, uh, called The Master Algorithm. Um, somebody will have to correct me if I've gotten his name wrong. Um, but anyway, uh, he, he had a really nice formulation of this where he said, in, with machine learning, basically what you do is you have the problem and you have the solution uh, and you let the computer figure out what the algorithm is to actually get from the problem to the solution. Um, and then AI is what happens if machine learning gets good enough that it can start to make its own machine learning algorithms, right? AI is where you where you remove to a point where uh, there is a kind of intelligence. Now, this is I guess AI is the fuzziest of these terms, and that might be a whole like another that's that's a whole other cocktail. So I'm going to stop there. Any other questions? As well, just at the front here. Early on, when both of you were talking about magical thinking. Um, us attributing meaning to these algorithms beyond what they actually have. I was thinking that that's a top-down explanation, but there's a, a bottom-up view that we do understand these algorithms, at least at a mathematical level. I mean, to take deep learning, we know what stochastic gradient descent is and backpropagation, but then there's a system's complexity as they start to work that we can't understand them anymore. And is that consistent with your explanation? Is it a different view? I think it is consistent because uh, so and, and again, I, I agree that there are technical understandings for how a lot of these systems work. But now we're building things that are so complicated that magical thinking creeps back into it. So uh, to take the example of Netflix, uh, there is this great investigation of how Netflix uh, uh, has started to taxonomize everything, every movie and television show ever made. Uh, and that they have this elaborate system for coding things. And uh, the system, in a way, is much more human-centric. And there's actually a human being who now watches every single thing that goes on Netflix and scores it according to you know some multi-hundred point thing and to, to decide whether it's got a happy ending or a sad ending and all sorts of things like that. Um, but it also is still a, a highly algorithmic system. And... Uh, when these these researchers realized that they could use the Netflix catalog online to sort of reverse engineer the taxonomy that Netflix had created, they discovered that there was this uh, this bizarre prominence of uh, Tyler Perry. Is that am I thinking of the right guy? Um, it's this this like weird. I think it was Hawaii Five O or something like that. Some 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 sort of uh, uh, Perry Mason. Perry Mason. Perry Mason was huge in the Netflix ratings, and Perry Mason was like in the top ten of the the great you know actors of all time when you did the network analysis of how how this how Netflix had broken everything down, and the 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 journalist talked to the architect, the VP of content at Netflix, who had who had constructed this whole thing. Actually, I don't think he was the VP of content, but he was the he was the architect of their whole machine learning approach to to content, and his response was, well, I don't know why that happened. 
And, you know, I think of this as the ghost in the machine. And sometimes we call it a feature and sometimes we call it a bug. Uh, and to me, that was a, I really appreciated the honesty of that response. And that was a moment where a kind of magical thinking creeps back in, even for someone who's a, who's a systems architect, right? Where uh, at a certain point you have to, to confess that you don't really know why these things happen. And, we, and his point was we construct narratives to interpret the outputs, uh, even when we don't understand why they, why they occur. Does that drive some of our concern over giving a degree of agency to algorithms that control things that really will affect our lives, such as stock markets? And we've already seen in 2008 uh, the flash crash that was arguably caused by, uh, let's just call it a bug in that case. <laughs> and and we're having a lot of conversations in the, in the UK and in Europe right now with the Stop Killer Robots campaign. They're, they're worried about the same problem emerging there that potentially one of these algorithms will, when we give it full agency and we don't have human oversight, will have some sort of bug that we didn't foresee that will cause massive amounts of harm and damage to human beings. Where do you stand on sort of the regulation of control of things that have to, well, things that actually look after massive things that affect us as human beings, whether it's stock markets or, or military weapons? So I was really inspired by a fantastic article in The Atlantic that came out a few months ago called The Coming Software Apocalypse. And the article made the ar exactly this argument that we're building these incredibly complex systems now and, it's, and the way that we build software is, is really stupid and short-sighted. And we assume that uh, human programmers can effectively anticipate all of these complex interactions and unexpected edge case scenarios, you know, really rare, random happenstance things, uh, and uh, effectively catch all of those exceptions and anticipate all of those problems before they occur. But we do it in this really idiosyncratic way where, you know, we're, uh, that's, that's, that's not effectively grounded, that's not scientifically grounded. And instead, we need to be thinking about the engineering and design of these complex systems uh, in a much more holistic mathematical way and that humans should not be writing the code, basically, is the fundamental lesson of it. Uh, and that we should be using um, systems that are much more like flowcharts where you, again, you effectively design, you effectively describe the, the problem or you effectively describe the question in very precise detail you know, where you describe every possible interaction between different components of the system and you talk about what should happen, what you, you do. So you, you, you start from a requirements phase and you, the requirements is the actual sort of human architecture of the whole thing. And then a system writes the code automatically. And this, the code is mathematically validated to sort of always do what it's supposed to do. You know, that there are no unexpected uh, exceptions caused by human error, weird programming foibles. Um, and I found that a really compelling argument. And this is being used in a few cases, you know, uh, creating software for some uh, airplanes in, in France. There's a company that does this. This is gaining currency, as I understand it. And, you know, a, a bunch of people at Amazon are interested in this. Um, I'm sort of hoping that this becomes a movement of the future because more and more of our systems work this way. Uh, it's not even just one complex system. It's the interaction of many different complex systems. Um, if you talk to people at Google, this is one of the things that keeps them up at night because there are many different complex systems that interact and the, the, you know, there's no way to catch all of the bugs. Some of the, the, the bugs just happen and you just pray that the person who caused the bug doesn't say a screenshot and post it on Twitter and say, hey, look, everybody, look at how I broke Google and then, you know, 50 other people try it. Uh, and that that's, and it's not a truly catastrophic bug, right? Because sometimes you don't actually know what weird cascade of errors is going to, 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 to cause a tremendous problem. Well, it goes back partly to the Douglas Adams quote of what you put in is, is what you get out. And the reason it was that number was because the question was wrong. So yeah. I just, I just fear that we're maybe giving non-humans too much agency. Any other questions at all? Uh, just to the back here. Um, just with kind of having the wrong questions. Um, a lot of these algorithms are being built on the kind of current econ companies that have an economic model of just basically making money for shareholders. Um, just would, wouldn't mind getting your thoughts on um, the possible way that that might be broken in terms of it's not to help humans out. It's just to 
through profits. So, uh, you know, th there are countervailing examples, uh, like the open source software movement and Linux is one interesting example of a, a collective, for the large part, nonprofit enterprise, right, To that lots of people have contributed to. Uh, Wikipedia, arguably, is another one. Uh, uh, and uh, so I think that the models are out there and there are ways to, you know, to create other forms of value that are not shareholder value. Uh, Bitcoin, I find really interesting as a as a as a point where there you you can you can see it as a contest between sort of a, comp a computational layer of value and a capitalist layer of value. And if you keep going down to the bottom, there's sort of an inter interesting question about whether Bitcoin is fundamentally um, a bunch of valuing CPU cycles or whether it's actually valuing some notion of of capital. Um, so uh, I think that yeah you, you know you need to escape the the notion of share shareholder value and a sort of a stock market driven company to I think to 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 start to focus on those other you know so uh, uh, cooperative models models where people are all stakeholders in the the system uh, and also models where the the system is valued not in just financial terms but in other kinds of in other units. And the measures of value, I think those are all really important ways to, to try and solve that problem. Well, we, we talk a lot about algorithms, but that makes us forget that there's already non-human agents out in the world that cause great deals of damage and harm to human beings. And those non-human agents are called corporations. And we've done such a bad job at regulating them. What makes you think it's going to be any different from regulating a, an AI or an algorithm? Well, I, I wish I had a more optimistic answer <laughs> to that question. Um, I, I think that uh, we, I, I guess the, the, I think that what we have to do is start to recognize that, right? And what, the one thing that algorithms are good for in that sense is disrupting established hierarchies and models. Uh, I think that was more true 15 or 20 years ago than it is now uh, because the big players online are fang uh, uh, and uh, it's not so easy to to be a new player right and escape the influence of of those of, of the, the sort of existing power structure online um, but i think that there are still opportunities for for creating new structures of power uh, and i think there are uh, there's a, a tremendous untapped potential for new kinds of collective decision making that hasn't really happened online that that could be happening and that could be a way to motivate say new kinds of collective action and getting people to to speak with a larger voice uh, and that's a way to you know make corporations listen to create different kinds of uh, dynamics for bargaining and, and uh, power sharing um, so I think that those possibilities are out there um, but it's it's I guess the question is whether you know that's something that could possibly happen on its own, or whether there needs to be some kind of a crisis. And if so, what kind of crisis would be horrible enough to actually motivate people to to change uh, from from the status quo without killing us all? Any other questions? It's from just here. Oh, just here. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit nervous about this microphone. <laughs> but um, after your talk, I was thinking about um, you know, bureaucratic structures and the way in which um, human... Because I think in your talk, I mean, I haven't read your work, but there's a lack of attention to some detail in terms of um, ethics or, um, you know, this kind of mapping of and, and I understand that words evolve but this mapping of the term algorithm onto all kind of features of human potential and existence it seems to me there's a kind of danger in doing that that we're using a very kind of reductive um, method and emptying it out of in, indeterminacy in a sense but also at the same time putting indeterminacy to play which is what I think large bureaucratic structures have been very successful in doing. So, you know, in the Second World War, the, the classic example of 
you know, just following orders and so on. There's no kind of place at which you can actually locate responsibility. So I'm just really, I mean, these are just thoughts that I've been having while you were talking that I wonder about this lack of precision, this imprecision in language. Um, and, and I wonder if you could say, because you, you yourself just now said, if we use the term algorithm a bit more loosely, I mean, you know, there's a need for precision in language here, I think. Um, and in thinking about um, decisionism and and ethics and moral responsibility, which a lot of the other structures that you've talked about, such as religious organisations, have their basis in, you know, whether or not they behave in an ethical way is another thing. So, I'm oh, sorry, it's a bit long-winded. So, uh, perhaps I haven't done a good job of describing my position, but I do think that ethics are really important. And what I'm really arguing for is uh, more attention to ethical considerations in computation and culture. Uh, so I think we're fundamentally in agreement on that. Um, and a, a large part of the book is, is really about the, the perils of abstraction, right? And, uh, uh, Nazi Germany is a parable about the perils of abstraction and how people were able to uh, to abstract people away into numbers, right, uh, and into uh, into objects. Um, and uh, so, so I think that uh, the what what I'm trying to do more broadly is is bring the term algorithm into the spotlight to question it as much as to, you know, I'm not, I'm not sort of uh, here, I'm, I'm not here to praise the algorithm, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I think that there is, you know, the, the, the notion of reductionism is really important. And I do, I think this is uh, uh, paying attention to the politics of those abstractions in those, in those reductions is, uh, is exactly what we need to be doing more of now. Uh, and I guess, um, I guess, I guess there's, you, you can sort of, you can take it two ways, right? You can, you can say, well, I'm against the algorithm because it, it, it operationalizes all of these things that should not be operationalized. Uh, all these things that should not be processes, but should be much more difficult and, uh, contextualized choices. Um, and the other way and th to approach it is to say, well, uh, people are using this word algorithm, but they're using it wrong, and and all of those, all of the, all of that context needs to be brought back into it. And you know, that's that if if you're going to be doing this kind of computational work, then you need to be taking all of this other stuff seriously. Um, so uh, so yeah, I, I think I mean I think that's a great point, um, and I think that uh, we're, we're fundamentally in agreement on on you know how great a point it is. I worry that we're going to look back at the early part of the 21st century and realize that was the period of time where us humans taught the algorithms to look in the image and likeness of us, to work in the image and likeness of us, to think in the image and likeness of us. And I, I wonder if we're ambiently feeding these algorithms uh, lots and lots of information. Do you think we're going to get to a point at which there will be a degree of replacement. So you're looking at these corporations who are looking to build fully decentralized, algorithmically driven corporations run by 10 people and self-driving cars. I'm, I'm thinking of Uber potentially as an example of where, what their methodology is. They've been harvesting driving data from humans so as to feed that into their system to create an efficient an arguably efficient system to allow self-driving cars to basically service the same need by humans. Do, do you think we're ever going to get to that point where we have full non-human agents, i.e. corporations run by non-human agents, i.e. algorithms? I see, I see Uber's cars around my offices almost every day because they're the self-driving cars, because the Tempe is one of the test beds. Uh, they're, 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 they're deploying their fleet there first. So I've, I've already met our robot overlords. Um, I do think it's a real concern, uh, and people have experimented with this already, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, e-currency Ethereum had this really interesting, uh, narrative and sort of 
crisis of faith a couple of years ago where they tried to create a digital autonomous corporation that would be a, a computationally governed uh, system, a computationally governed venture capital fund, essentially. Um, and it fell apart for uh, more or less external reasons uh, to, that, to that mission. Um, but there are a lot of people interested in this. It's, it's clearly going to happen you know, in different ways. Uh, and I think that the question is, what are humans going to do and how can humans continue to be involved in different ways? Uh, and I think the, that, that sort of the, the future of work and the roles that we're going to play uh, is a really pressing one. And again, where we need to, to, to do a lot of that imaginative thinking, uh, because if the human future is the one where we're like the, the, the attendants to the automated bathroom, or where we're just like the the person who sits in the in the self driving car and chats with the passengers, you know, I'm not sure how fulfilling a future that is for humans. Uh, but I do think uh, that there are uh, there are alternatives. Getting back to the idea of uh, chess, uh, you know, it's been 20 years since uh, since a computer beat the the best or one of the best human uh, chess masters, uh, and the the answer was not that humans stop playing chess, uh, or even that the, the that the IBM's Deep Blue was the was the jet, the best chess player in the world. Actually, the best the best games of chess are now played by hybrids of, of humans and machines. Um, so they call they're called centaurs in this in this field. Um, and the best teams are not even necessarily comprised of the best chess players working with the best computers or the best AI chess programs. Uh, the best centaurs are the groups of people who are, you know, good enough at chess, but have figured out the best processes to gather data and and to integrate results from different chess programs and different humans. So, you know, maybe a team of three or four people and a couple of chess computers can beat basically anybody else, right? And they're the the apogee of of the game right now. And that's interesting to me that this kind of collaboration uh, and aug human augmentation is uh, is more effective than machine intelligence alone or human intelligence alone. And I think that's the, the goal we need to aim for more is to find ways to, so instead of, you know, replacing all of the auditors with machines uh, to say, okay, well, what can your auditor, your, your person with 20 years of experience in this auditing job, what are they free to do now that they couldn't do before? How can they be much better at their job now that a bunch of the grunt work is, is taken over by some machine? Uh, so we need to be finding ways to ask those questions. To what degree do you think blockchain is going to help solve the transparency issue? So you talk about it briefly in the book, and, and you say it's going to be very interesting when arbitrage starts to trump content when it comes to the blockchain. And I'm not talking about cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and Ethereum, because let's face it, that's a pyramid scheme. But blockchain, the, the underlying technology of blockchain and its potential to allow for greater transparency over the transmission and sharing of information. So I think it's it's very interesting as basically just an inventory management system, and you know there there are provocative uh, examples in, in any kind of logistic scenario where you could suddenly know the precise history of every single uh, you know object that's traveled through a system uh, in a way that's more distributed and decentralized than anything that we use now, um, and you could imagine that being really useful. Uh, I think this is a you know classic example of a of a tool that could be used for all sorts of good or or ill political purposes you know and it could it could it, it's 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 just a tracking mechanism and it can be as transparent or as non transparent as the architects of that particular blockchain want it to be you know the blockchain as it's used in Bitcoin is a public ledger that anybody can look up. Uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. It could be used in other ways. Um, so, uh, you know, there are sort of utopian prospects there. You can imagine blockchain as a system for uh, validating uh, votes for some kind of digital democracy. Um, you can imagine it as a way to to track relief aid after after a natural disaster. Um, uh, to eliminate corruption, right? Different things, uh, different different approaches like that. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be so. So I, 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 I'm I'm sort of guardedly optimistic, I guess I'd say. Probably have time for one more question. 
And if there aren't any more questions, then Ed, I'm going to ask you, how do we become better collaborators with computation? I think the beginning is, is that notion of literacy. We have to understand how our machines are actually working. And just as importantly, we have to understand the bargains that we're making with our machines because we're making those deals all the time. And if we don't understand the terms, then we're never going to get to that, that stage of, of, of true collaboration. So on that note, Ed's book is now available. You can find it on Amazon's. You may also like, and just at the bottom of your previous search history, knowing this audience. And I want to thank uh, the Library Club for hosting us. This is our last event of 2017. We've done multiple events here. This this uh, organization, this club, has been very kind to give us the, the space and the time to curate a multitude of events. I think we've almost had one every single week in the last couple of months. So uh, we will be back in 2018. Uh, follow us uh, everywhere online at Virtual Futures. You can support what we do. We're entirely audience funded. You can support what we do on Patreon. And uh, I also want to thank um, our helpers this evening, Maria and Stephen Oram. And I also want to put a special note towards Stephen Oram. Stephen Oram runs our Near Future Fiction series. So very much like what Ed was describing, we realized at Virtual Futures that a lot of audience members were coming, putting their hands up and saying, look, this conversation reminds me of episode three, season two of Black Mirror. And we realized that it's about time that we uh, drag science fiction authors from back rooms of smelly pubs in London and bring them to stages like Virtual Futures. So Stephen's leading that charge on uh, reinventing how we think Think about science fiction and its usefulness on navigating some of these issues and and we're actually open for submissions we have four near future fictions events next year you can find out more details on our facebook or our stephen uh, submissions close on the 21st of december so if you are a short fiction writer start writing now and i want to end with this which is how we end every single virtual futures which is with a warning and it's this, the future is always virtual and some things that may seem imminent or inevitable never actually happen. Fortunately, our ability to survive the future isn't predicated on our capacity for prediction. Although, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable does come of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything it seems to promise. I hope you feel you've done that this evening. Please join me in thanking the incredible Ed Finn. The bar is now open. <laughs>